we've looked at some of the common psychotherapies. Now we're going to move on and we're going to look at some of the biomedical therapies, which basically work on your biology, the root cause of what's going on with the person that's causing the issues so that they can start feeling better. And of course, drug therapy is one of the things that's involved here. So psychopharmacology is the term that we use when we look at medications to work on your, your psychology, to work on your brain. Um, factors to consider with drug therapy is like when a new drug is produced, everybody gets very excited about it. But often that excitement will go away because when we start to compare it to normal recovery rates of people that were untreated and also compare a placebo effect that happened, that often the drug's miraculous effect is not there. A lot of it was just due to people getting better on their own and on the placebo effect. That's why we use the double blind procedure, which if you remember back in the research unit, is where the the researcher and the the subjects of the research do not know whether they're in the treatment condition the con or the control condition, and so it's double blind. Researchers are blind and the patients are blind, and then we can test for the placebo effect. And we should see an increase in the experimental group or the treatment group that is larger than the placebo group. So we'll start with antipsychotic drugs. Now, antipsychotic drugs are just what they sound like. They're antipsychosis. And psychosis are those things where we have um, mental images, we have things that are, make us out of touch, kind of basically with re reality. And this was a big thing, especially like things like schizophrenia, that would pe put people into mental hospitals for a long time in the past. However, with the advent of some really good drugs, we find that we are able to treat the schizophrenics to the point where a lot of them can go and they can lead normal lives. Now, usually it's a combination of the drug therapy along with some other kind of psychotherapy. A drug that's uh, commonly used is, is chlorpro <coughs> chlorpromazine, and it's often sold as thorazine. And basically what these things are, are antagonist drugs that block dopamine receptors. And we find when we block those dopamine receptors, especially positive symptoms of schizophrenia will subside, things like hallucinations. Um, there are side effects to these drugs. Uh, some of these side effects include um, tardive dyskinesia, also includes weight gain, it includes um, fatigue, dry mouth, those types of symptoms. And what tardive dyskinesia is usually over long-term use. Sometimes those people will start to lose control of their muscles, especially in the lower face, where they'll start to have kind of tics and involuntary movements. So tardive dyskinesia is often a term that I've seen on AP exams, so make sure you understand that term. Some of the newer drugs, risperidone and olanzapine, have been developed, and chemists will you know, continue to develop drugs that will work on our neurotransmitter systems that are better. And we find there are fewer um, side effects with these newer drugs. And of course, it'll probably continue advancing as we go into the future. Anti-anxiety drugs. Um, these are ones like Xanax, Ativan, D-cyclosorane. Um, these are ones that usually work uh, on your on your central nervous system. So they basically depress it. They slow it down, much like alcohol does. That's why it's very important that when people are taking these type of anti-anxiety drugs that they are not drinking alcohol at the same time uh, because it can have an adverse effect on that patient. Um, it, it, it gets to the root of how people are feeling and people start to get um, addicted because, you know, they start to get to a stressful situation and they're just, they just get used to popping a Xanax. Now, when you do that, of course, you get some kinds of reinforcement that would be negative reinforcement because it removes the anxiety. And because of this though, people can develop a dependence to these drugs along the way. Now, antidepressants, uh, some of the more common ones that we have, you know, fluoxetine, which most of you know is Prozac and Paxil, we, we call them SSRIs. And we use them with mood disorders and anxiety disorders. We've also found them effective with OCD and post-traumatic stress disorder. So rather than using the term antidepressant all the time, we'll use the term SSRIs as the family, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Um, now, people that take these drugs, an antidepressant like this, it's not like the next morning they feel better or, you know, they take the pill and you know, people call them happy pills. And they're not really happy pills. What they do is 
try to adjust your chemistry so that you can control your moods. Um, one of the theories why we think it may take so long is once we calm those nervous system that perhaps neurogenesis takes place, you know, over the course of approximately a month, uh, where these side effects may come into play. So there are many side effects of antidepressants as well, including you know, fatigue, sleep problems, um, all of those types of, of uh, effects we don't want. When we're talking about side effects, there are effects that are we are trying to get from the drug, but all the other effects, we will call them side effects. And again, we're, we're coming up with lots of new ones. Ciprolex is a, is a new one. Again, the chemists has improved them. They seem to work a little bit faster with fewer side effects. And if you remember with the SSRIs, this is how it works again. The SSRIs, selective reuptake, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, the, the drug will actually go in and block the reuptake sites so your norepinephrine and your serotonin become more uh, efficient. They are left in the synapse to make the next neuron fire. Even though you don't have more, they're there ready for use so that neuron can fire more often. When we do studies on these drugs, we find a lot of times with the use of SSRIs and antidepressant drugs that some research has shown it doesn't do a whole lot better than a placebo or other kinds of therapy using exercise and those types of things or, you know, uh, using counseling. And we do find, though, there seems to be quite a big benefit with the antidepressants for people with severe depression but perhaps it's more of the placebo effect and just people getting, you know, coming better, getting better over time uh, when they have mild to moderate. However, again, this is something that somebody would listen to their doctor to because they're aware of this and they will pay attention to the effects and how it works on somebody. Our mood stabilizing medications would be things we'd use for things like bipolar disorder. We would try to stabilize the mood, try to keep it into more normal range instead of the severe ups and the severe downs. One of the things that's used, and it's still used, and it's, it's a very cheap salt, basically, it's lithium. And the lithium really seems to alleviate the major ups, and it also seems to alleviate the depressive uh, states. Um, Depakote is another one of these drugs that has been developed as well. So normally when somebody goes to a therapist with this, what the psychiatrist or the doctor will do is they will give you a prescription and then they will regulate your moods. They'll have you regulate your moods and they'll find out um, you know, where you are. You don't want to be too flat, and but you don't want to have those big extremes. So they want to give you more of a normal range of what a person has. We are human beings and we're all going to have ups and downs and we certainly don't want to overcorrect that and make somebody totally give them a flat effect. We also use brain stimulation, which might surprise some of you. Electroconvulsive therapy is still used. It kind of gets a bad rap from the movies that it was presented in before as being kind of barbaric, you know, where people will be sitting there and they, they shake uncontrollably and they're in, in massive pain. Our procedure now, though, is much different, where we will give the person a general anesthetic. We'll also give them a muscle relaxant to avoid injury. And usually a current is sent through the person that will last about 30 seconds to a minute. And after this works, we found it's quite effective for severe depression. Doctors will often use this as a one of the last resorts to treat a, dep a depressive symptom because it is considered to be somewhat invasive. There doesn't seem to be any real bad side effects from it when the people have it. The, they will forget things immediately before they have the treatment. And during the course of their treatment, over the month or so of their treatment, they will have periods where they have, you know, short-term memory interruption. And it's, it corrects itself, and there really doesn't seem to be any long-term lasting effects. And it does seem to be quite effective. We don't totally understand why it's effective. Um, we think it may just, you know, calm areas in the brain through stimulation that are causing the depressive thoughts and it might stimulate other regions you know especially in the frontal lobes where we have you know some of those bad ideas like especially in the in the right frontal lobe um, so there's not really a lot of side effects and problems but it is a last resort we still use it it still gets a bad rap because people from remember it from you know the movies and the old way it used to be done 
Uh, however, they're, they're not really versed on what it is. But sometimes anybody thinks if we send an electrical current enough to put a brain into seizure, that that's probably not a good thing to do. However, it has proved effective for many, many patients. Here's the, the device, and you can see they will monitor all of these things. We'll postpone that computer restart. I'm in the middle of something, don't they know? We monitor their heart rate, and we will monitor you know, their blood pressure, um, all of those things. We're recording electrical activity going through the muscles through an EMG. We'll also monitor their blood oxygen level, and then we sent the current through the stimulating electrodes. And once again, uh, it's not as much voltage as we used to use, and the person, it's painless. They have no memory of this once it's finished. So they had no pain at all. Some other alternatives to neurostimulation, which is what basically the electroconvulsive therapy is, we have magnetic stimulation through repetitive transcranial magnet stimulations, or RTMS. And what this is, is sort of a magnet that we will, they'll just place over it. The person is wide awake. They don't have to be sedated at all. And it's, they don't really feel anything, but they, they'll put this magnet over top of the skull, over top of your head, and they'll move it along. And it seems to have the same effect of electroconvulsive therapy. Um, perhaps again, this will, you know, stimulate regions um, to, for neurogenesis, the creation of new neurons. Uh, or it may stimulate regions that are not work functioning properly in a depressed mind. Um, beyond that, we go into deep brain stimulation where we can actually turn up the force and see how far down into the brain this will go. And we can hit areas between your frontal lobes, which do your thinking and your limbic system, which is your emotions. And we can, we can stimulate that brain region to actually slow down. We find that region is overactive in a depressed individual. So when we go through there, it'll change that, it will slow that down and often can help alleviate depression. Still a lot of research to be done on this, but there's kind of, a, you know, some very exciting things found. You know, when we look at also genetic research, if we, when we identify genes that cause depression of that, we can really come up with effective medications and effective treatments. So it's always improving. Again, it's a young science. Oh, here's a close-up of the magnet. So it kind of shows the field depth. This is the wire coil, which is the magnet, which sends the pulse. You're, you're put into a frame so you don't move your head, and it will activate neurons in that magnetic field. And it's set to a, ma a maximum depth. So the area we're talking about on the deep stimulation is right in this area between, it would be deep, you know, you can't see it, around the limbic system and the frontal lobes. Psychosurgeries are sometimes done. We used to use lobotomies. Now, the history of the lobotomy, it was started, and a person discovered this. If we can, you know, separate those, the frontal lobe basically from the limbic system, that we can calm violent and hard to manage mental patients. And so this procedure was done quite often. It was quite a simple procedure. Often, they would shock the person into a coma, and then they would take, like, ice picks and put them over the eyes, between the bone and the eyes and push it back to hit the skull and they would just hammer it in and then they would take them and, and they would just move them around and there you have your lobotomy. So it didn't take long to do and they thought this was effective for treating violent and hard to manage inmates, not inmates, patients. However, we found there's lots of side effects. Obviously, there's lots of danger. You're, you're, you're doing brain damage to the individual and Lobotomies are a thing of the past. We will use some forms of um, psychosurgery on a very rare basis. It's considered to be a very last resort because it is invasive. You're changing someone's brain, so you're, you're changing them. So it's not done on a whim. And after about 35,000 of the lobotomies that were done, um, it was discovered that it actually didn't have the actual effects that it wanted. But what it caused was people that were unmotive, uncreative, and really unfeeling. So there were, some of them turned into almost, you know, zombie-ish sort of existences, which is definitely not what we want. The other thing, you know, a lot of those other, the other, the biomedical therapies, you know, we want to look at integrating you as a biopsychosocial system. And a therapeutic lifestyle change has shown to be very good at 
changing depression. Your body is a system. And when everything is working properly, you are less prone to mental problems, mental disorders. So these includes things, getting like aerobic exercise, you know, at least three times a week, getting adequate sleep. Sleep is something you come into the world needing, and a lot of us don't get enough sleep. It is something that is necessary, as you remember from our sleep unit. The, you know, if you live to be the age of 90, you're going to be asleep for over 30 years of your life. And it's, it's not just because you're lazy, it's because sleep is a necessary thing. You also get light exposure, exposed to daylight, social connections, you know, being involved around with other people helps stave off depression. That interaction seems to stimulate us. Anti, it causes anti-rumination. We have other things to think about and we have a different type of lifestyle. We can go through and we won't, you know, harp on those things that, are, that are, seem to be bothering us. And of course, nutritional supplements, getting good nutrition. Um, your body, of course, again, is a whole system and it works on the nutrients that you put into it. And those are the things that we find with a therapeutic lifestyle can be very, very effective in, for example, depressive symptoms and other forms of mental disorders. So this is something that is often looked at now with therapists. And it's also a way to stave off these problems. These are just good, healthy life choices. So when we compare all the biomedical therapies that we look at, we have the drug therapy therapies, which look at basically neurotransmitter malfunction, too much um, activity in that neurotransmitter or not enough. And we can it will control symptoms of psychological disorders by altering the brain chemistry through drugs. Brain stimulation is usually for severe depression where people have not been have not responded to medication, have not responded to psychotherapy. And we will do this to alleviate the depression because these other therapies don't work. And that is to stimulate your brain through electroconvulsive shock, magnetic impulses, or deep brain stimulation. Psychosurgery is brain malfunction and it's for severe disorders. Okay, and we will remove or destroy brain tissue. You remember when we had... Uh, you know, people with epilepsy, sometimes we would go in and we would s sever their corpus callosum. Now, often we can identify areas where there is difficulty with that corpus callosum where the messages are being sent and just destroy that one little part. Now, therapeutic lifestyle change looks, you know, the problem we look at is would be like you have stress in an unhealthy lifestyle, which manifests itself as psychological disorder. And what we're trying to do is restore your healthy state, your natural, healthy, biological state. And after lifestyle through adequate exercise or alter lifestyle through adequate exercise, sleep and other changes that are beneficial to your well-being and your health. OK, so those are the therapies. Of course, it's just an introduction. We are not licensed therapists at this point, um, but we do get an idea. Now, I do suggest you read through the book. Um, the textbook and also make sure you know that you look at some of those drug therapies understand the differences and similarities similarities of course being most of the drug therapies involve a face-to-face -face interaction and the effectiveness of all of them okay so we're finished this one for now we've got one more unit to go to finish this course okay bye for now folks